Good afternoon. As most of the Western world was sleeping, as all of us know at this point, the Russians decided to undertake a full-scale invasion of the sovereign nation of Ukraine against the expectations of many. Vladimir Putin finally decided to roll the dice, and this is most probably going to be the greatest tragedy that has taken place in Europe since the outbreak of World War II in 1939. This was an unprovoked invasion. This is a wanton act of aggression that no doubt is going to take many, many civilian lives on top of military lives. Now, a lot of people would, you know, resort to the idea that Vladimir Putin is a madman, that he's another Hitler, that sort of thing. In my opinion, this is actually a reaction that's typically Russian. Historically, Russia will not tolerate what they regard as a potentially hostile nation right on their border. It's the whole reason that they went into Afghanistan once their puppet government fell there. And since 2014, when the Ukrainian puppet government fell and Ukraine started to make overtures towards NATO, towards the European Union with a desire to join the Western world, World. At that moment, in 2014, in my opinion, their fate was sealed. Russia was not going to tolerate what they regarded as a potentially hostile nation right on their border, with the potential of putting foreign troops just a few hundred miles away from Moscow. Every invasion of Russia has gone through the Ukraine. Napoleon went through there. The Germans went through there in the First World War and the Second World War at the cost of tens of millions of Russian lives. Now, am I saying that this is rational? Absolutely not. It's completely irrational. It's totally paranoid. But it's also something that the Russians have done time and again in order to secure what they regard as their national security. They did it several times during the Soviet Union during that particular time. Most of the moves that Stalin undertook were to, again, secure the borders of the Soviet Union, as vicious as that man was, most of it was his own paranoid delusions about potential threats to Russia, and Vladimir Putin is doing precisely the same thing. Even though Ukraine represents no threat whatsoever to Russia, regardless of who they decide to join up with, and NATO certainly has no designs on invading Russia any time in the near future, that doesn't seem to matter to Vladimir Putin, and he he's going to secure Russia's borders, going to secure this buffer zone that they've always had in Ukraine. And once again, completely wanton, complete aggression, and complete disregard for innocent lives. I don't give a damn what their reasons are. I don't give a damn what the so-called justifications might be. This is an act of untold aggression that simply must not stand. So, what happens with the ISS? How the hell do American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts collaborate now in the future when some of the most extreme sanctions in the history of the world are being taken against Russia? Yeah, maybe not as bad as what we're doing to North Korea, but still, it's going to be extreme. So how the hell can we expect to collaborate on the ISS? It would seem impossible. And so does this mean mean that it's the end of the ISS 10 years before we were just going to have it re-enter the atmosphere? Is this the end of something that started out so promisingly in the past? Well, we're going to explore that right now. Scenes like this were commonplace only a few weeks ago on the ISS. Now it seems like these sorts of things were happening centuries ago. It seems almost impossible for something like this to ever return. This entire environment of collaboration, of friendship, of unity in the face of political tensions, regardless of what's happening on Earth, astronauts and cosmonauts working 
working together to achieve the same goals. And indeed, even as of February 23rd, yesterday, the U.S. State Department said the following, quote, as the world follows the political activities related to Russia and Ukraine, NASA continues to safely conduct research on board the ISS and cooperation continues with Roscosmos and our other international partners. And this is from the director of the Office of Space Affairs in the State Department. No changes to major upcoming events, including the launch of a Soyuz spacecraft with three Russian cosmonauts on March 18th, and then on March 30th, the return of a Soyuz spacecraft with two Russian cosmonauts and a NASA astronaut, Mark Van de Hey, and I believe I pronounced all of that right. So how is this going to change? How can American astronauts ride on Soyuz capsules? How can cosmonauts ride aboard Crew Dragon? How can these people continue to serve together in the current political climate? And make no mistake, even though most cosmonauts probably do not support what Putin is doing right now, given the fact that they have a much broader international experience than the average Russian citizen does, that doesn't mean that Roscosmos has a different view. On the contrary, Dmitry Rogozin yesterday said the following, quote, we greatly value our professional relationship with NASA, but as a Russian and as a citizen of Russia, I am completely unhappy with the sometimes openly hostile U.S. policy towards my country, unquote. This quote, in my opinion, sums up the whole reason that Russia went into Ukraine. They regard the U.S. as a sometimes hostile country, so do they want American soldiers in Ukraine, which would certainly be possible under a NATO treaty. Absolutely not. Again, part of their whole paranoid, delusional approach to foreign policy, but it's something that's been going on for a very long time, and it's something that I'm afraid is going to infect the ISS, and there's no way to avoid it. And these sanctions that are about to take place are going to impact space companies as well in many different ways. Obviously, Russian engines and indeed even Ukrainian technology is integrated into the Antares rockets that we currently use. And as far as the Atlas rockets are concerned, well, fortunately, the last one of those has come off of the assembly line. And assuming that ULA finally gets the BE-4 engines that they've been waiting for from Blue Origin by the end of the year, there should be no significant impact on military contracts with ULA and the U.S. Space Force. In theory, Where's My Engines, Jeff, is no longer just a joke. It's an absolutely vital component of American security because all of these rockets that we've been using in the past that utilize Russian engines, all of this has to come to a definitive and decisive halt. And not just in terms of military missions, but NASA missions as well. No rockets using Russian engines need take up another NASA mission in the future, aside from the ones that we've already purchased from Russia. The consequences go further than that, much further. For example, there are British rocket companies such as Skyrora that make use of Ukrainian technology. Skyrora is actually a partially Ukrainian-owned company. What happens to them? What happens to so many different space agencies that, or organizations rather, that have Ukrainian interests of some kind? All of these companies, no doubt, are going to be in serious trouble. And another mission that's going to be in serious trouble is the ESA ExoMars mission that is scheduled to launch in late September on a proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. How the hell can you be imposing extreme sanctions on the nation of Russia and at the same time expect them to send up an important Mars mission on one of their rockets? It seems implausible. 
And by the way, this is only a small sampling of things that are going to be seriously impacted by this invasion. The OneWeb constellation is going to be in a world of hurt, given the fact that all of these satellites are being launched on Russian rockets. Sure, through Ariane Spas, but they're purchasing their rockets from Russia. How do they keep doing that if you're imposing significant sanctions? It doesn't seem possible. But what happens to the ISS, in my opinion, is the most significant threat of all. How do you expect these people to continue to work together and continue to collaborate when their governments are at odds? It's not like we can separate the station into two halves, even though this sort of thing, this crazy concept, has been suggested by Ross cosmos their systems life support everything else is so integrated there's really no practical way that you could separate the two stations and also what about some sort of version of what happened in the science fiction movie 2010 only american astronauts on the american side of the station and cosmonauts on the russian side of the station as absurd as that might sound perhaps that might be a way to emphasize the political differences that exist. However, repairs to the station, maintenance work, EVAs, all of these things are generally done by cosmonauts and astronauts working together. And finally, what the hell do you do about the cosmonauts who are going to be riding on Crew Dragon and astronauts riding on Soyuz capsules? That obviously has to come to an end. You can't be giving cosmonauts rides up to the ISS, whether they're paying for it or not, if you are supposedly imposing the most extreme sanctions on Russia in human history. If you really are doing that, that means you can't be demonstrating that close of a collaborative system. So should everything shut down on the ISS? I mean, it sounds like without collaboration, this station isn't going to function. And yet, any sort of collaboration, doesn't that show some sort of enabling of what Putin's doing? Doesn't that show some sort of tacit approval? Well, here's my opinion on how things should proceed something should be done. Perhaps no cosmonauts on Crew Dragon and no astronauts on Soyuz capsules. Bring that to a conclusion. However, the ISS should continue to function and should continue to be some sort of conduit of communication, some sort of diplomatic tool used to bring Russia and the United States closer together as this crisis drives us further apart. Because as the war in Ukraine continues, and as the body count continues to increase, and as the condemnations from the Western world and the sanctions from the Western world against Russia continue to be ratcheted up, putting further and further pressure on Putin, in my opinion, there needs to be some sort of diplomatic channel, some environment where Russians and Europeans and Americans are all getting together and all working together and depending on one another for their very survival, which is what the ISS is all about. And perhaps, just perhaps, this station and its small population can demonstrate to Putin, to Russia, and to the rest of the world that people collaborating together towards a common goal is a much better way of solving problems than warfare and bloodshed. I have my doubts, but one can only hope. In the meantime, Slava Ukraini, and I urge all of you to stay angry about space.